today about with one foot in heaven. I will talk to you about a good, a good, a very precious young man who seemingly had everything going the right way for him, but brother and sister, and he did not make a good decision. From Mark chapter 10, begin reading verse number 17. The Bible says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled down to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Amen. And said unto him, One thing thou lackest, Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, and take up the cross, and follow me. And he, and he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in their riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking around them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And I will share with you this morning about a story of, of a young man who had one foot in heaven. The story of this rich young ruler, as we understand him from all of the Gospels that we read about, is one of the tragedies today that we think it exists is, and may I say, one that's in the Bible. Uh, before us stands a young man who seemingly had everything in his favor. I mean, this boy had it all going the right way. He was a young man. He had wealth. He had all that you would think that could be acquired and would want to be acquired by a young man in this world. But here's a young man who lacked one thing. And when he was brought face to face with what to do about eternal life or the things of this world, uh, he turned away and he walked away from the Lord of glory. He faced Jesus Christ like everyone here this morning will face the Lord. I mean, this man made his decision and he chose his destiny. He had the power to do that. And you have the power this morning as you face the Lord Jesus to make heaven your home or to turn and leave this building the way that you came. That power is in your hands. This young man come running to Jesus and he asked about him. He said, what must I do to have eternal life? That exactly is what I believe it ought to be on the mind of everyone. He wanted to know about life. How is it that he could make heaven his home? Now, when Jesus told him about that, he was telling him not about eternity of living, but he was telling him about how that you could enjoy living. I believe that eternal life is not in quantity as much as it is in quality. I want you to understand that I was saved at the age of 17, and it was at 17 years old that I received eternal life. But you say, well, brother, you got a lot of years added to your life. No, I got a lot of life added to my years. Somebody hear what I'm saying right now. When a person gets saved by the grace of God, it's then they start living. It's only then that they have life. Jesus come to give life. And whatever you may have this morning, if you do not have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you don't know what living is. Hallelujah. I've seen some of the saints of God. It may be that their physical life was wasn't long, but their spiritual life was so blessed and so wonderful because they had Jesus as their Savior. Now, this rich young ruler, he had plenty of money, but ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of things that money cannot buy. Money can buy you a bed, but money cannot buy you sleep. 
Money can buy you food, but money cannot buy you an appetite. Money can buy you medicine, but money cannot buy health. Money might buy you a house, but money cannot buy you a home. Money might buy a diamond, but money cannot buy love. Somebody give me a witness. And above everything else, money cannot buy you salvation because it's a purchased gift by the Lord of glory. And so this young man had a lot of things going his way, but he was saved by God's glorious grace. And may I share with you briefly and quickly this morning as we look at the story of this young man. Notice, first of all, we see the life that he lived. In these first verses that we look into the Word of God, the Bible says that this young man came running to Jesus. Notice what the Word of God says. And when he was gone, I come this way, there came one running and kneeled down and asked the good master about eternal life. Now here is a young man who had a very good upbringing. Uh, he said that he kept all the commandments. I might question that, but needless to say, he did say that. This young man was a good young man. In fact, when I think about it, I think, I think every young person ought to know the commandments. I've always been saddened that they was removed from the walls of our schools or the hallways or anywhere in public places. I tell you, if there's anybody that I believe needs to read the Ten Commandments, I think in America right now, our people needs them. Amen. I hope that young people knows that thou shalt not steal, or thou shalt not kill, or thou shalt not bear false with, or thou shalt not commit adultery. Those are important. And while this man, he said, I kept those commandments, I say that he was a very clean young man. In fact, a young man that he gave in these particular verses would have joined about any Baptist church. In fact, he would probably be considered to be a deacon in most churches because of his clean life, his moral living. And all that he said about himself uh, was ho so highly uh, that we think of. The life that he lived was the life of a young man who was commendable in all that he did. But I say when I think about the Bible, the Bible makes war upon any attempt to substitute human goodness for divine righteousness. And when this young man is coming to Jesus, he's trying to get Jesus to okay him by what he did and what he was doing you be well aware today that you can't hide behind your own self-righteousness their filthy rags in the face of our Lord and your goodness will never be good enough it was our Lord it said in Matthew 21 and 31 he said the publicans and harlots would go into the kingdom before the Pharisees because they trusted in themselves that they were righteous rather than trusting in God and so this young man had one foot in heaven he was almost like he was headed that way he was good he was clean he was blessed in a lot of different ways in fact when I consider the life that he lived I see two things that stands out uh, number one this young man was healthy look again at verse 17 the Bible says that when Jesus had gone forth there came one running to him. You say, Brother Billy, what makes you this, think this young man uh, was both young and healthy? Well, I, I try running sometime. I come out this week and I walked up that stairway up in the balcony a couple of times. I was needing oxygen. I said, dear God, I didn't know there was any many steps back there. It's so hard to get up. I remember a few years ago, that wasn't no problem for me. Don't tell me you, you know what's wrong. Amen. I'm saying this young man come running to Jesus. I'm saying this was a young man, a healthy young man. I, I like what he did. I like what he come running to Jesus. He was enthusiastic about getting to the Lord. Uh, he was interested in being where the Lord was. I think he came in his prime. May I say this morning that's noble. I believe when he come running to the Lord, he didn't come walking to the Lord. He didn't come strutting to the Lord. He come while he was in the tender years 
of his youth. I thank God that somebody will come and present the Lord the flower of the youth rather than bringing the stem where they live for the devil and present it to the Lord. Uh, this young man didn't burn the candle for the devil in the world and then blow the smoke in the face of the Lord. I want to tell you, I believe that young people ought to get saved. Children ought to come to know the Lord. When you're young, come to Jesus, come to him. In fact, isn't that what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12 and 1? Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, uh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. He said, remember God when you're young and healthy. Remember the Lord when you're just a child. Get saved young. And then you can say, and I had a good youth for years. And you won't have to say, as that preacher said, you don't like to remember your childhood. But if you serve God and get saved by his grace, get saved while you're young. You see, young people can serve God. I like to be around enthusiastical young people. People has got some health. They still got some red in their cheeks. They still got a, a little skip in their step. I mean, them kind of people can serve the Lord. We need young people today to step up and serve God and love Him and not wait till they're old and they're dying. I'm not against somebody getting saved when they're old. Please don't misunderstand me. I baptize last Sunday night, an elder gentleman uh, crippled somewhat uh, in his leg. I was excited. In fact, to do something like that, few is able to do because few of people get saved up in their years like that. And I'm glad they do. But I tell you, it blesses my heart to see young people come to Jesus, be saved by the glorious grace of God while they're young, and then they can sing with zeal. They can testify with power or preach with power. Or they can go and visit and run all day long and not need to see a chiropractor when they come home. What a joy it is to have someone young serving God. And so here's a healthy young man. I think maybe that we're aware that every good thing begins in one's youth. Education begins in one's youth. Hey, folks, I'm 62 and I might be learning, but I just didn't start school yesterday. Uh, ch children start school at a very young age, amen? I mean, whether we learn anything is not their fault, amen? But children start their education young. I mean, if you're going to be something, you get out there and get an education, and it takes years. But brethren, thank God you, you go get it, amen? And you can do something for the Lord. You need to serve God while you're young. I say, well, number one, this boy was healthy. But may I say, number two, this boy was humble. In fact, when you look back at verse number 17 again, the Bible says not only that this young man, when he come to the master, he come running. But notice the next phrase. The Bible says, and kneeled down. I like that. This young man come running to the Lord. And when he got there, he kneeled down before the Lord. He didn't strut into the presence of God. God honors humility. I think that's manifest by His glorious grace. He loves those. It's of a contrite spirit. Amen. All through the Word of God, we're told how that God is wanting to save those of the humble spirit, uh, those that comes to Him and honor and loves Him. And Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Uh, when David had committed his transgression in Psalms 51, uh, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, David said, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would have gave it. Thou delighteth not in burnt offerings, or David would have gave that as well. But the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. God wants people to come to him, acknowledging who they are what they've done, and down on their knee, humble before the Lord. I'll tell you today that some people will never see the kingdom of God. And you know who that crowd is? When the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 about we're saved by grace through faith that not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Don't forget that. And it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Could you just imagine
being somebody up in heaven, walking around and bragging and telling everybody else what they did to get there, what they accomplished down here, what church they built, what mission they might have started. I tell you, they'd be expelled from heaven because God only lets humble people who knows they're there because of the grace of God. They're there because Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood and brought us a forgiveness of our sin. We're saved by grace and not of anything we do. This young man had one foot in heaven. He was a good young man. He was a healthy young man. And he was a humble young man. But no, not only the life that he lived, but notice the Lord that he faced. If you notice again in this verse, number 17, the Bible says that this rich young ruler came running to Jesus. Now I want you to understand something, that he came to the right person. Uh, there's only one person that I know can give life. There's only one person can share salvation. Now this may be questionable in the years that we're living in to come right now, but I want you to know and go down on record that the Word of God says that Jesus is the only way to heaven. In fact, our Lord said in John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. There's a thousand ways to get to Jesus Christ. And I've saw people saved in so many various ways. But there's only one way to get to the Father. And that's through Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. In Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name given under heaven or among men whereby you must be saved except Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not a good way to heaven. Jesus Christ is not the best way to heaven. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. When many religions goes to coming into America and they tell you that there's a God and maybe there's other ways to get there, I remind you there's one way. Jesus is the only way. That will become questionable in the years that we're looking into right now. People will criticize the statement I just made. But they can't make heaven any other way. You'll not make it. You might be good. You might have one foot in heaven because of your goodness. But that won't be enough. I want you to note the Lord that he faced. Notice quickly the identity of Christ. This man called Jesus good master he came running to the Lord and he said good master that was not a snarl he was honest and Jesus Christ said to him why call ye thou me good there's none good except one and that's God the identification that Jesus Christ was receiving was when he was here, he was God. He said there's only one good. If I'm good, there's only one reason for that. It's because I am God. And may I say again, and may this be certainly burnt and etched into the heart, into your conscience, that when Jesus Christ was here, he was not just a good prophet. He was not just a good teacher. He was not just a good man. He was God in the flesh dwelling among us. That's Jesus said, I, you're identifying me. And he said, you identify me as being good. And if it's so, it's because I'm God. Jesus asked Peter in Matthew 16, 13 and following, he said, who do men say that I the Son of Man am? And Peter began to roll off some good, important names. He said, well, some of them identify you as John the Baptist. Others identify you as Elijah. Now, that's pretty high on the totem pole. Amen. That's pretty good. Some of them identify you as Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus looked at Simon Peter and said, but who do you say I am? 
And Simon Peter looked at him and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Upon this rock I build my church on the perfection of Simon Peter that Jesus was God and come in the flesh. I wonder today, who do you think he is? I say that Jesus said he was God. He's always been God. He always shall be God. God never changes. God never diminishes. He'll always be the same. Jesus Christ was God when the world began. He was God before the world was formed. He was God on the plains of Mamre where he spoke to Abraham. He was God on Mount Sinai and he gave the commandments and the law of Moses. He was God in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He was God in the manger of Bethlehem. He was God in the carpenter's shop in Nazareth. He was God in the boat on the lake of Galilee. He was God in the temple at Jerusalem. He was God on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was God God in the garden. He was God on the cross. He was God in the tomb. And I want to tell you, bless God, when he comes back, he'll declare himself to be God. He's always been God, and he always will be God. Note, not only I say quickly that they identified Christ, but notice the authority of Christ. Notice Jesus said in verse number 21, he spoke about the, to the rich young ruler, uh, he, he said to him, uh, one thing thou lackest. You got, one, you got one foot in heaven. You're a good young man. And he commended him without a doubt. But yet in his authority, he said to the rich young ruler, one thing thou lackest. What could such a clean young man like? Someone who had did what he had done. Uh, yet Jesus Christ knew what was in his heart. He knew that upon the throne of his heart was gold rather than God. He knew that this young man had material possessions. It was his treasure. And Jesus looked at him and said, Go and sell what you have and come and take up the cross and follow me. You see, Jesus is the final authority. He always has been. He always will be. And we must fully comply to his commands. And what Jesus requires is total surrender. Spurgeon said, what was the one thing that the young man lacked? It was the full surrender of his heart to God. You can never be saved until you're willing to make him Lord of your life. I read about it back in Civil War days. There was a man who owned several slaves. One of them was a Christian. He was so godly that his testimony stood out, and folks knew it, and the, ma the master knew it. But the, ma the man who owned him was wealthy and full of pride. He was a self-righteous man. And he often would ignore or overlook the, the, the poor slave in his religious ways. But then one day, uh, there was tragedy come to the life and the family of the rich man, and immediately he thought about God. And when he thought about God, he thought about that slave, and he thought about how his testimony was, and he, he went to that slave and he began to ask him about how that he could be saved. Now the slave knew his master and he knew his pride for walk and his self-righteous attitude that he always carried. And the slave said to him, you've got to be willing to go down here to the hog pen and get down in the manure with me and pray and ask God to forgive you. And that self-righteous, prideful master looked at him and spit and even slapped him up against the wall and walked away. The only thing was, his tragedy or his heartache didn't walk away. He still felt the burden of his sin. He still felt the pain that he needed help until in his brokenness, it's sad, but does it not come that way sometimes? He come back to that slave and he said to him, I need help. I'm willing to go down and to get in the manure in the hog pen and pray. 
And the slave looked at me and said, well, you don't have to do that. All you got to do now, since you've come to a place of humility and, and it's trust, uh, we'll kneel right here and God will do it. You hear what I, he just did? It was in his heart. He, in his heart, he was willing to humble. In his heart, he realized he needed God. You don't have to go to that way. You don't have to do that. I hear some people say, you got to do this and though to get saved. No, no, all you got to do it's when God knocks at your door like he will do here today is get up out of your seat and walk down this aisle and kneel here at the altar. But wait a minute, here's the problem. Some people so full of pride, well, they look around. Some of you are looking around right now. Well, what would somebody here think if I were to walk down that aisle? Well, what would somebody say if I did that? You know what you got right now? You got a problem with pride. And you're not broken enough. You're not coming to the place where you're willing to see what you need so bad. You want Jesus as your Savior. I've thought many of a time of my own life, 17 years young. I was cool, long-haired. I thought I was so attractive. Every girl at Mount Nash would fall all over me. I, they'd give the invitation, and I would say to myself, that's not cool. That's not cool, walk down an aisle and go up there on an altar. That's not cool. I'm not going to do it. I even have a man out talk to me about my condition. I, I upset me that he had to, would even try. But I want to tell you, it was only a little bit later that I got so broken and so crushed that I didn't care who saw me and who thought and what, whatever girl around here thought about me. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I'm telling you, I fell on that altar and I wept like a baby. Pray and ask God to forgive my sin. I didn't want to go to hell. I wanted to be saved. And I'll tell you, when you come to that place and you're not worried about what somebody thinks or somebody says and you're willing to humble yourself and seek his face, I'll tell you, God will save you. The authority of Jesus says you've got to call him Lord. The Bible said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. I tell you, he's got to be total. I, I want you to hear me. I need to skip just a little. Let me say lastly. Let me say lastly. Notice the love he spurned. I'll be brief, but listen to me quickly. Notice the love that he spurned. Verse 21 and following. Notice the statement, Jesus beholding him loved him. Now, why Mark is the only gospel writer that tells us that Jesus Christ loved him, there's no question that Jesus Loved a lot of us all through the Bible. The compassion of our Lord is noted. He was compassionate towards so many. And ladies and gentlemen, may I say to you that Jesus did not love him because he had position. Jesus did not love him because he had power. Jesus did not love him because he had possessions. A lot of people today, young people, a lot of them today have got a conditional love. And a lot of Baptists have conditional love. A lot of people I find, if you believe like I believe, you act like I want you, you drive what I want you to drive, you dress the way I want you to dress, I might love you. But God loves you like you are. There was no conditions in the love Jesus had for this young ruler. This boy had one foot in heaven. I mean, he was loved. God loved him. And he loves you today. Regardless of who you are, what you've done, what your background is, or anything about you, God's love is not conditional. It's unconditional, and he loves you. He loved this young man, and he loves you, young man, young lady, middle-aged or older. He loves you, but you can spurn the love of God. I note quickly as I share this. Notice the shattered hopes of Christ. Now, while Jesus loved this young man and had great hopes for him, when Jesus Christ looked at him, I'm very well aware as he looked at you, he knows the potential you have. And when he saw that young man, he said, you know, there could be the next Paul. There could be the next Timothy. Oh, what he's capable of becoming. And Jesus sees each of you young people. He sees you and he knows there's potential in you. He loves you and he's got great, great hopes for you. And so he looks and that young man, he says, I've got things this boy could do. I loved him. But yet he said, there's one thing you lack. One. One. You see, this is really what gives us grounds to say in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short 
of the glory of God. This young man had one foot in heaven, kept the commandments, honored his father and mother, had been a good neighbor, had been a great person, had done everything right. But the Bible says that he comes short. One thing he lacked. That's sad today, but regardless of who you are, if you're born in Adam's family, you're going to come short. God loves you, but you've got to realize there's a need in your life. And Jesus said, there's one thing you need.